Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Patrick Sullivan, and I am the President and CEO of the Halifax Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to start out by thanking uh, our presenting sponsor for today's virtual summit, RBC. You can see that great big RBC logo right there on our first slide. A couple of RBC logos. RBC is a huge supporter of economic growth in our region, and we're very pleased that we can continue working with them through this pandemic. You may know the Chamber's been hosting weekly webinars since March, with topics focusing on supporting your business, including labor law, financial management, and mental health support. And I think I've actually done one with uh, Kelly earlier in the year. Today is our first virtual summit with a full afternoon of exciting content. Uh, from local business owners, national speakers, contact tracing experts, and regional economists. The Chamber planned this summit a number of weeks ago to provide an update to our members and to help us looking forward as we all move towards solutions. This week turned out to be a great week to host the summit as cases are increasing across the globe. And sadly, uh, Nova Scotia is no exception. However, we're still much lower than the rest of the world. When I look at our 10.4 cases per 100,000 population, versus Ontario's 86.4 cases per 100,000, I know how lucky we are. I'd like to remind everyone that our rules and regulations, the restrictions that we have in place are working to protect us. And we at the Chamber actually feel pretty good about the stiff rules that are in place right now uh, so that we can move quickly through this next round of COVID and get back to where we were. So please continue to wear your mask Stay at home if you're feeling unwell, wash your hands and practice good sneeze and cough etiquette. Now, before I go on, I did want to mention that just an hour or two ago, the province of Nova Scotia announced a new grant program for restaurants, bars, gyms, and other businesses that were ordered closed as of midnight last night or 12.01 today, I guess. There is now a one-time grant of up to $5,000 that will be made available to support those businesses in Halifax, in the Halifax Regional Municipality and in Hans County. Um, and that will be, uh, there'll be more detail available on that, including the application process uh, within the next couple of weeks. But uh, I think that's very good news. It is a percentage of revenue. That's how it will be judged, a 15% um, uh, amount of the average monthly gross revenue for either April or February uh, of 2020. So, uh, pleased to see that the province so quickly came out with a, a new grant program. It's now my pleasure to introduce Kelly Swirl, Regional Vice President, Business Financial Services with RBC, to introduce our keynote. Kelly, over to you. Wonderful. Um, can you, audio okay, video okay? The audio is great, but I don't see you, but there you are. There you are. Fantastic. I'm going to turn off the video, Kelly, so we can leave the focus on you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. Um, as Patrick noted, my name is Kelly Soriel, and I have the privilege of leading RBC's business financial services team across Atlantic Canada. Uh, my team works closely with and on behalf of our small, medium, and large size business clients um, to provide outstanding financial advice and service um, that's really tailored to the needs of their business. Um, during this difficult season, uh, not only has RBC been ramping up new digital innovations to make your banking safe and convenient, uh, but we're also identifying unique ways that we can help you weather the time uh, beyond banking, such as e-commerce uh, and recruitment, employee health and wellness, payment solutions. Um, in times like this, it is critical that we lean into all available tools and resources and support agencies. And so on that front, I would like to thank the Halifax Chamber for taking the lead on today's conference. Um, and also to the Cape Breton and Yarmouth and Amherst Chambers uh, for promoting this to your members. There's always been a really strong sense of cooperation and partnership in Nova Scotia, and uh, that is certainly evident here today. 
And it most definitely speaks to the times that we're in, that we're able to come together so quickly. Um, and in my mind, it is because we collectively are driven by a common purpose, which is to help Nova Scotian businesses weather these very difficult times um, in order to position ourselves successfully in the future. Um, so to that extent, your local chambers have been doing incredible work um, on behalf of their members. And for that, I can tell you that we are all extremely grateful. They've also been a great partner with RBC on Canada United, uh, which is a national movement to support local businesses in our communities. Um, in August, Canadians were encouraged to join the movement uh, by sharing their love for local on social media. And $2 million was generated for the Canada United Small Business Relief Fund. This new fund provides small businesses with grants of up to $5,000 to cover expenses related to PPE supplies, uh, renovations to meet reopening guidelines, um, and also developing or improving their e-commerce capabilities. Now, last month, the federal government announced an additional $12 million to Canada United in support of small business. And so here's my important bulletin and, and my big ask. Uh, with this new additional funding, we are now accepting more Canada United applications. And so my ask of you is to go visit gocanadaunited.ca, um, review the eligibility criteria, and see if your business qualifies. And then obviously submit your application. Uh, we want to make sure that those grants get into the hands of local businesses right here in Atlantic Canada. And I know that I don't need to tell you how important that is. Um, but I'm also here today because I have the pleasure of introducing uh, our guest speaker, RBC's John Stackhouse. Um, John is a senior vice president in the office of the CEO, a former editor-in-chief uh, and report on business editor at the Globe and Mail. Today, John leads RBC's thought leadership team and is responsible for advising our executive leadership group on emerging trends in, in Canada's economy. His work primarily focuses on technological change and innovation um, and examines how to successfully navigate the new economy so that more people and companies can thrive in this age of disruption. So truly, I can't think of a more appropriate or important time in history for John to be doing the work that he's doing. Um, and when it comes to small business with so much change happening at such an accelerated pace, Having deep insights and accurate information to help you navigate these times is absolutely invaluable uh, because it's critical that businesses recover, uh, not, not just recover, thrive. Um, our way of living depends on it. So in one of John's reports, there's a phrase that really spoke to me, and it says, Canada's rebuild will depend on small businesses rebound. Um, today, I know that uh, John and the other speakers and panelists will arm you with insightful information to build a strong foundation for the future prosperity of your business. So, John, Thank you for agreeing to join this event, um, for spending some time with us. We're excited for you to, ha uh, to have the opportunity to hear from you. Um, and I'm confident we're gonna gain lots of value from your presentation. So I will pass the mic over to you. Great, thank you so, uh, so much. Good afternoon, uh, everyone from uh, here in, in Toronto. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for that generous uh, introduction. And uh, really thank you to uh, you and your team for uh, for the great work you've been doing this year and the leadership you're uh, adding to uh, adding to the region. Uh, Patrick, always great to uh, be with you, even virtually. I can feel your energy uh, over the miles. And as hard as this year has been for everyone in different ways, uh, it's so uh, encouraging and inspiring, frankly, to see how, uh, how you continue to try to move things, uh, move things forward. And I have to believe that the business community uh, is going to be stronger for it. And that's a lot of what I want to talk about today is, is how, how we can look uh, beyond the current crisis to the opportunities that we need to, uh, need to prepare for. I've got, uh, we've had uh, some, some technical glitches, so I should just pause for a moment and make sure you can hear me. <laughs> uh, that's always a concern. Thumbs up. That's always a good signal. Uh, I don't have to say Houston or Halifax, we have a problem. Uh, so I'll get, uh, get going. I've got a presentation as well. Uh, which I'll, I'll go through, um, just waiting to see if it's been uh, been loaded because the the machine that I've got it on 
is not uh, is not connecting with the with the Zoom call. If it doesn't load, I'll just get uh, get talking and really really want to get into get into the conversation. Um, okay, it's loaded, so away we can go with it. If I can just get uh, get to this, uh, bear with me. I hope everyone appreciates the uh, the awkwardness of trying to do presentations from from a distance. Um, and uh, there we go. Here we are. Um, I'm going to get this to the full screen. Um, Patrick, I, I was thinking this morning of the last time I was there uh, in 2019. We had our annual meeting. It was just an extraordinary time for, uh, for all of us at RBC and uh, really look forward to getting back to, uh, back to those, those uh, happy moments and always looking forward to being in, uh, in, in, in Halifax. I've been doing this presentation. Uh, there we are. <laughs> across the country, edited in British Columbia virtually a couple of days ago, about a really interesting piece of research that, uh, that we've been doing uh, on the eight ways that COVID is transforming the economy and disrupting every business. We put out this report in the depths of the crisis because we thought there's too much disruption going on uh, to not try to capture this in the moment and help our clients think through these disruptive forces and trends. And we've been updating it through the year uh, and happy to send the, uh, the link to the latest, uh, the latest version. And what we've seen through the year is that these trends have become more powerful, not less. The transformation of the economy continues and will continue, we believe, into the recovery. But it's taking a different, cur uh, different turn. I, I was impressed with that photo at the beginning of the, the, the winding road, which is a bit of uh, what we're seeing as, uh, as well, of, uh, of, a, of a winding road of disruption. There you are. So um, sorry, I'm just having um, trouble moving these images effectively. When I look back to uh, the year, it's humbling how much economic scarring there's been. But one in five Canadian businesses shut down in the, in the spring. Some started to come back in the, uh, in the fall uh, and late summer. You saw that in, uh, in your region. And the Atlantic bubble, I, I, I know there's uh, changes, but was uh, actually an impressive, impressive intervention uh, that uh, the rest of us in the country watched with great interest and intrigue and sometimes envy. Uh, and we noticed that business in the Atlantic region was able to recover actually at a better clip than uh, many other parts of uh, the country. So kudos to those in the region that are, uh, that are making that happen. Uh, as Patrick was saying in the, in the introduction, uh, clearly we're going through another challenging moment uh, and it will feel like more than a moment uh, while, we're, while we're in it. And fortunately there is that relief there, and if we can do anything to help with that, I know Kelly and her team are on on standby to uh, explore every constructive option that we can. Uh, to reiterate the point that Kelly made about small business in this country, it is the backbone of our economy. It is has been hit much harder than other parts of the economy by the lockdown for a variety of reasons, but particularly by the uh, lack of ability of a lot of small businesses to move to a digital or platform economy, especially over overnight. Uh, but it's going to be equally or more important to the recovery. Uh, we will not have a recovery of any uh, measurable size in this country if it is not led by small business. That is something we stress to policymakers across the country and to the federal government every chance we can, that this has to be a small business led recovery for many of the reasons that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get to. And when we look at the Atlantic region, we see uh, a lot of hope for that. Um, I'm sorry, with the, these slides, we um, are having a bit of... a challenge here. Um, in fact, uh, operator, if we just want to take the slides down, I'll, uh, I'll uh, just, just speak and not... Uh, distract everyone with our, uh, with our glitches. Um,
yeah, I've suggested we just take the uh, take take the slides uh, take the slides down. Thank you. Um, As I was saying, this has to be a small business-led recovery. If you haven't seen in today's Globe and Mail, there's a profile of our CEO, Dave Mackay, uh, who's a huge fan of the Atlantic region, loves Halifax, gets there every time he can. Uh, but in it, he talks about the point that Main Street is going to be central to the recovery. His, uh, his quote, which I didn't quite appreciate till I read it in, uh, in the Globe this morning, is Main Street is what makes this country go. Main Street is what makes this country go. I think that's a beautiful expression. And at Main Street is going to make what the recovery goes when it, gets, uh, when it gets going. Our challenge is going to be making sure that we are driving both Main Street and digital Main Street. And that's a, a lot of what Canada United is trying to do. We have to understand that the economy is becoming not all online and not all physical anymore but it's becoming a hybrid economy. And that's the, the, the key takeaway from our eight trends report is that we are moving into fully a hybrid economy. And the businesses that are thriving that we're seeing are managing this hybrid model. It's not all online, it's not all in place. The ones that are able to serve customers in both venues, though the, 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 the omni-channel model or the omni-channel uh, way of thinking is really going to drive Canada and the Canadian economy if we, can, uh, if we can get it right. When we look at the recovery, we, uh, you've probably heard the expression K-shaped recovery, but this is critical to, uh, to all that I'm gonna talk about with these eight trends. If you think of a K or at least the, the part of the K where it hits an inflection point and then bounces up, half of the economy is bouncing up very well right now the tech sector. Manufacturing is doing much better than many uh, expected. High-end services, professional services are doing better than many anticipated a number of months ago. Half of the economy continues to flatline. Hospitality, retail, restaurants going through an excruciating time. And as we think about the recovery, and I think the, 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 the federal budget or economic statement next week is going to focus on this, we've got to think of ways of bending that uh, by focusing on particular sectors, getting those sectors bending up to the rising part of the K, get us more towards a V-shaped recovery uh, and, and away from the K. That's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen on its own. It's not gonna happen simply with stimulus, as important as, as, as relief will be. It's going to happen if we can help all businesses think about a new hybrid way of, uh, of, of, of serving customers wherever they are because the economy has been transformed over the last eight months. And what we've seen over the last eight months, if my slide was up, you would see a line that says the future is now. Everything we're seeing is not a recess. This is not a, 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 a diversion from where, we, uh, where, where we're going. The future is now. Uh, and if we learn from what we're going through right now, uh, our businesses will be much better uh, poised. When we look at the Atlantic region, we see all sorts of examples for this model of the future is now. You have the brain power, you have the global aspiration, you have great clusters like Halifax to make extraordinary things happen. I did a, a, a virtual session with Alan Lau from Wattpad uh, a couple of months ago talking about the importance of Halifax and why Wattpad was investing in Halifax for its growth because of the talent there, which we see from other companies. The Verifin story from uh, Newfoundland earlier this week, uh, the, the um, um, cyber fraud company that uh, has been sold for $2 billion to NASDAQ, $2.3 billion, is another indication of what the brain power of the Atlantic region with global reach can do. So what they're doing is bringing the future forward, and we need to learn from them, also from each other, of how to move that forward. So much of what uh, the future is going to be about, if we can move to the next slide, is the hybrid model. The hybrid model of, uh, of all that we do is going to be critical to business thinking and to policy making in, uh, in, the, years, uh, in the years ahead. So what does that look like? If we can jump to the next slide, please. It means serving customers wherever they are, whenever they want, however they want. That can be in person, that can be online, and it's usually usually a model of both. If we can jump to the next slide, please. You'll see in our report of the eight trends, 
illustrations of the hybrid. And when we, we did the first version of the, uh, of the report in June, we thought the economy was going to become uh, more digital all the time than it did. It swung back, and I'll get to ways that it did. And it's going to continue to swing back a bit like a pendulum, not all the way back. We're not going back to 2019, but we're not going to stay in 2020 either. So think about where we, we can go with this hybrid model. That starts with how we work. Uh, we see that in our own employee base. I hear it from clients and employers across the country. People have developed the habit and increasingly the expectation that they can work at home or work wherever they want, work remotely, and have the option to work in place. Employers also want that flexibility. They like the flexibility of employees being able to work whenever, wherever they are. But we're also seeing the power of clustering, of bringing people together to innovate, to create, and to collaborate. So we need both, and that's hard from, from an efficiency point of view. We're seeing this in our own organization. When we look at surveys, including our own, we see that half of the employees out there want this dual model. But half of the companies out there, and probably a lot of you feel this way, you may not have the technology or the skills to make this happen. This is going to require a forward-thinking investment on all of us when we may not have the extra capital to invest in workplace tools, but we're going to need to because that's going to drive efficiency and growth in the, uh, in the recovery. It's going to mean new tools and new technologies, new work processes, also great opportunities for entrepreneurs who can think about how to serve all of us who are trying to create the workplace of the future that is both remote and in place and always, always on. That takes me to our next slide, which is how we shop. At that point of always on, always in place, wherever that place may be, is critical. We're not becoming the Amazon economy, although it may feel like that to a lot of us, both as consumers and as providers. Amazon clearly is a dominant force today and will remain so. But we're also seeing retailers adjust because all of us as shoppers are adjusting. Sure, we want deliveries to, uh, to our doorstep, but over the summer, we saw an incredible increase in buy online, purchase in store. Bopis, essentially the curbside pickup model. Not easy. What we're doing today or what we see today is probably not what it's going to be there in 2023, but retailers who are figuring out how to help consumers receive things at home, but also pick things up when and where they want are starting to accelerate. So it's the omni-channel model, but it's, it's really thinking about serving the consumer, the customer, wherever and whenever they, uh, they want. And through all of this, remember that habits are being hardwired. Typically in human behavior, when we do something for six months, it becomes a habit. Things that we thought in March or April or May were weird, like this kind of presentation, are very normal today. These habits are being hardwired and they're being hardwired with our, our, our customers. The second thing I try to stress to audiences is bear in mind that loyalty is now in play. There has been an a, a almost unprecedented willingness among consumers over the last eight months to try new brands, to buy things from organizations, providers, companies that they may never have bought of or even heard of uh, before. Loyalty in some ways is a jump ball. That means that if you uh, expect the loyalty of your consumers, you may want to check that assumption because others are knocking on their virtual door. But at the same time, you can now reach customers anywhere on the planet in ways that you probably didn't imagine eight or 10 or 12, 12 months ago. So lean into, that, uh, lean into that opportunity, which takes me to our third point, which is how we watch. When I talk about this point, people often think about binging. <laughs> of course, we all uh, are, uh, are culprits in that. But how we watch is transforming so much of the economy, but also of every business. If we could jump to that slide, please. How we watch has been shifting significantly through the summer. It's actually not about binging. Of course, the streaming services are doing incredibly well. That's great for creators, including a lot of Canadian companies that are getting their, their content onto Netflix or Disney Plus or YouTube. Uh, but it is also fundamentally changing the conversation 
between business and consumers. If you are a content creator and every business today, whether you know it or not, is in the content game, you are creating content that is informing and guiding the decisions making of your consumers. That can be social media, that can be public engagements like this, this can be products that you are creating for media or for, uh, for streaming platforms. We are all in the content game and we are all consuming more content than we probably thought was humanly possible even a year ago. But over the last few months of the crisis, we are seeing a significant change in the way that we are all engaging with content. People are looking for interactive content. We don't want to be couch potatoes as much as we may enjoy a couple of hours of that in the evening of, of sitting back and watching Netflix. People are leaning into content and they are wanting to engage in content. There is a profound increase in gaming consumption and in gaming interaction, just even in the last few months, especially among people who are under uh, the age of 35. But we are seeing this in other content forms. TikTok is a great uh, illustration of this, of a new generation that wants to help shape content. They don't want to be just watchers. They want to shape, change, and share. That is the new content universe. So if you are hoping to converse with consumers, not just in your backyard, but around the world, think about ways where you can help those consumers shape and share your content in a constructive, positive way and you will be miles ahead of many of uh, your competitors. Got to think about multimedia and think about always on. That's what the new economy is. It's always on. Which takes me to point number four. I'm sorry, I'm told I can move these slides. There we are, of uh, how we share. All of this is about sharing. Even this conversation is about sharing, which comes down to, boils down to data. Of course, that's gonna mean more bandwidth that is critical to your region, to so many parts of Canada, and we're pushing government on that. But it also means that every business needs to be, see themselves as being a data business. And if you don't have a data strategy, be fairly confident that others, including the platforms, are developing data strategies for you. So think about the data strategy that you can develop and you can own. Think about developing with the platforms. I don't see them as evil. They're willing to work with you on this, but make sure that you are the author and the owner and the driver of your data strategy. It's not data for data's sake. It is data for understanding your customers and helping them understand who you are, what you do, and what you can do for them when they want that. Think back to those earlier points. That's all data strategy is, uh, is about. Of course, it means more investments in, 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 in cloud, in cybersecurity, and other things, but great opportunity there as, uh, as well. Point number five is about how we travel, and this is critical to the Atlantic region because travel is such an important part of your economy. This has been a brutal year for the travel industry. You very well know that. But it can also be an opportunity in crisis for us to reimagine what travel is about. We're gonna go back to traveling. As a species, we love to explore. Humans have for thousands of years gone beyond the boundaries of our ancestors. It's how we are wired. We're gonna get back to that. We like to wander, we like to explore, we like to smell and sense and see things with our own eyes and we'll do it differently and we'll do it safely. I'm fully confident in that. But this crisis surely has given us all an opportunity to also help people travel virtually. And if we are not developing new ways to engage with people around the world virtually, to help them see and experience and sense our communities, our regions, we're missing a moment because that back to the hybrid model is going to be the travel of the future. If we are not using this crisis to create more local travel, and I know the Atlantic region has been terrific at that, really a leader in Canada, and we should all be learning from what you're doing, we're missing an opportunity because that shouldn't go away when we're allowed to uh, travel again. We need to continue to explore and experience. The experience economy is going to grow in the 2020s. We need to continue that. Let me talk quickly about points number six and seven, which is how we heal and how we learn. 
so critical to the Halifax region. This is a healthcare crisis like we've never seen and hopefully we'll never see again. And surely we have to use this crisis to transform the way we approach healthcare. There is a willingness among patients, among policymakers, and among caregivers and professionals to approach and deliver healthcare in entirely new ways, from telehealth to remote diagnostics. Uh, great opportunity for entrepreneurs, for tech creators to scale what they do and sell that to the world. An urgent opportunity for us to transform the way we age in place and to use technologies to do that. So let's make sure we're leaning into this crisis, we're not running away from it, that we're leaning into it, not just to address the healthcare challenges of today, but to transform, to innovate the way we do healthcare so it can be even better, more efficient uh, and healthier in the years ahead. The same goes for learning, number seven, how we learn is an incredible challenge, but also an opportunity in this crisis. And Halifax is one of the great education centers of our country for colleges and universities. And I really miss the opportunity to spend time on Halifax campuses. But this is an opportunity for us as Canadians to develop the next generation of education at all levels, but especially post-secondary education. We're not going to go back to all classroom all the time, nor are we going to all online all the time. You have seen the surveys that show the frustration with online learning. But there are models that are emerging and we need to be the authors and owners of these models that allow our great educators to both provide in class, on campus, and online education. And it is not online for the sake of the convenience of online education. It's not about putting a lecture on YouTube it is about using those data, the power of data that I talked about earlier, to transform education, which means to personalize it, to use data and data-led diagnostics to personalize education so that education moves at the speed of the learner, not at the speed of the teacher. And that is such a critical message for every business, that when you use data, when you transform, when you build hybrid models, your business can move at the speed of the consumer, not at the speed of the producer. And that is way better for you as a, uh, as a producer. All of this is going to be critically important, not just to our evolution and revolution as, uh, as a business community, but for our place in the world, which takes me to my last point of how we trade. We are in a world that is going to be more protectionist, that is going to have more techno-nationalism. The Biden administration is not going to change this dramatically. You've seen just in the last number of weeks, the number of new trade agreements in Asia, in Africa, in Europe, even between the UK and Canada, that shows where the puck is going. This is not ne necessarily all negative for Canada. Of course, as a smaller trading nation, we need the multilateral system and we will continue to push for that. But there are opportunities in this new trading reality where a nimbler, more knowledge-based economy like Canada can insert itself into new trading relationships, especially in the digital economy with the US, with Asia, with Europe, all for a better, faster, uh, more sustainable growth for our country, for our regions, but also for each of, uh, each of your businesses. But as that's going on, let's also bear in mind the enormous, enormous opportunities that are emerging in our own country from more by local initiatives. We need to ensure these are designed and accessed for the development, growth, uh, and innovation power of our, of our companies. So let me wrap up with a few observations on what, uh, what we take away from all of, uh, all of this. We need to think of a distributed economy. The 20th century was about centralization, office towers, campuses, hospitals. Everything that's going on today is about the distribution of economic activity. And how do you think about your business in that distributed model? Not bringing customers into where you are, although you need some of that, but also getting economic activity and service provision and excellence out to the point of consumption. How do you build hybrid models that allow you to do that, to compete always in an always on in all places all the time model how do you think about the ha hardwired habits of your employees 
and of your consumers and probably of yourselves as business uh, thinkers. And one of those habits needs to be the new habit around data and seeing the power of perpetual data. Data is not about a spreadsheet. It is about a, a never a, an always rushing river that allows you to always have your meter in there, understanding the currents of the market and of your consumers. Next, how do we think about the opportunities so beyond the enormous challenges of the coming weeks and months? Because if you do not start to prepare for these opportunities, they may start to take off on you sometime in 2021 in a way that you'll regret because others will seize on those opportunities. There's a lot of wealth out there. It's right now parked in savings accounts. We see that uh, an enormous increase in savings this year. It's parked in real estate. It's parked in stock market value. That wealth is waiting to be untapped in 2021. So as we go into the holidays, what's your strategy to untap literally the trillion dollars of wealth that is sitting in North America right now and waiting to be spent and invested in the years ahead? How are you thinking about the new loyalty game? about protecting the loyalty or investing in the loyalty that you've had over the years, but also gaining the loyalty of customers you've, uh, you've never met. That requires a new approach to engagement. How are you thinking about engaging consumers in your backyard on the other side of the world in entirely new ways and reaching new consumers? So let me wrap up with uh, a, a few challenges and questions we're putting out to, uh, to uh, the regions and our customers on how to go about this. Uh, we published a report this year called Small Business Big Pivot. I think uh, uh, the, the chamber has helped circulate that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send links around as well. But in it, we lay out, uh, if I can just jump to the next slide, please, a number of ideas for small business and medium-sized businesses to rethink your addressable market. The market that you were trying to address a year ago is not gonna be the market you're gonna rely on a year from now. So what are the boundaries of your market? Are those boundaries of your own making or the boundaries of the market? How do you make yourself relevant to government? We are about to see an unprecedented amount of spending in this country. And it's incumbent on business, big and small, to think about how do we help, solve, how do we help government solve its problems, which means the problems of society. And how do we use the funds that are out there to both solve those problems, but help our businesses grow, not just to keep the lights on, but to innovate and grow and be more competitive through the 2020s. Well, to do that, how do we think about everything that we do being exportable? Because we all need to be exporters, no matter what we do. And to do that, we need to think of ourselves either as digital platforms or as part of digital platforms. And that can include the regions, that's what Canada United tries to be is a digital platform for small business. We don't need to leave it all up to Amazon and Google. We can build these micro platforms ourselves. So think about your digital platform opportunity. And then lastly, what are the skills that you're going to need or that we're all going to need to take advantage of this? Because the skills that we relied on a year ago are not going to be entirely the skills that we're all gonna need a year from now. And if we're not investing in those skills and the systems that we need, to, uh, to develop those skills. We're gonna wake up a year from now finding we're probably a step or two behind, uh, behind, the, uh, behind the game. So let me uh, uh, turn it over to um, Patrick and Kelly for, uh, for conversation. Thank you all for your, uh, for your attention, for being part of this conversation. I'm sorry for a bit of the, uh, the, the tech kick up there, but that seems to be uh, the new normal in, uh, in some ways. If you want more on, on uh, all of these topics, Come to our website, rbc.com slash thought leadership. Follow me on social media, LinkedIn, uh, or on Twitter at Stackhouse John. You can get our reports on the eight trends in the small business big pivot there. And if you're a podcast listener, subscribe through Apple, through uh, uh, Google, through iTunes, through Spotify to the RBC Disruptors podcast. Latest episode just dropped uh, yesterday. A great conversation with Jim Ball Silly the co-founder of uh, BlackBerry Research in Motion, talking about the IP, the intellectual property revolution that we need in this country. Uh, we need to turn places like Halifax into IP gold mines that, uh, we, uh, that we leverage for 
the wealth and growth of uh, not just the region, but the country. So thank you again, Patrick, for uh, hosting this and hope we have some time for conversation. That's great, John. Thank you. I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, Perfect. I'm, I'm, I've, I've turned off my video, but I don't see myself, but um, I don't know why. You know what? I think I may have, uh, there we go, back to gallery view. Um, this is great. Thank you very much. I, I must say I listen to disruptors usually when I'm mowing the lawn. So now, now I have to think of a new time to, uh, to listen to the, uh, to the podcast uh, as, uh, as we move forward. Um, this is, uh, it, it is fascinating and I, I really enjoy the, um, the materials that you release. Uh, it's great information. I, I do love uh, the, the eight trends. I loved it earlier and it's, it's still equally applicable. I mean, we're seeing so much change, um, so much activity, um, but is, there, is it reasonable for businesses to be able to keep up with this level of change? I, I know I've heard someone from RBC, whether it was Chris or Kelly or maybe yourself, talk about how the acceleration to digital has moved RBC forward so much more quickly, sort of three or four years ahead of where you thought you were going to be. How's a smaller business going to keep up um, with that with that pace of change? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question, Patrick. And I think one of the un, um, underestimated challenges of this crisis has been the um, the cost it's uh, or, or the price it's exacted from from leaders. It's been very hard for all of you just, you know, you're, you're doing heroic work to keep the lights on to keep people safe to help governments make decisions just to get us through another month or another year. Uh, and sincere thank you for that. And you, but that means you haven't had the time or the, the, the energy to think about uh, a lot of these bigger, bigger challenges. And I hope as we're transitioning, uh, if I can leave you with one message, it's use this opportunity to, to gradually think more about these, uh, these opportunities. And use this opportunity to leapfrog. Don't think about just getting back to where you were. Think about what can I do radically different to jump into 2022? Maybe that means stopping doing some things. Had a great conversation. I uh, did a similar discussion with the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, last week or two weeks ago. And there was a coffee uh, shop owner on it, a young woman who said, this crisis has turned my coffee business into a data business. I thought, <laughs> you're kidding me. That's uh, what we've been talking about. And she later, she goes, no, 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 no. I figured out when I had to shut the doors, I took my business onto social media. I started coffee conversations and started to mine data to understand what turned people onto coffee, what led them to purchase from me online. We started delivering kind of the omni-channel way. And then she was able to take that to Sobeys and say, you know what? I kind of figured out the coffee patterns of Saskatoon <laughs> and I've got the data for it you want to talk? <laughs> They're like, yeah, let's, uh, let's talk. What can we do to get those folks into Sobeys to pick up your coffee so you don't have to deliver it and some other stuff while they're, uh, while they're here. So just a small illustration, uh, and it's never as easy as uh, probably I'm presenting it, but an illustration of how you can use a crisis for opportunity to leap, to leap ahead. Right, absolutely. Well, I mean, we've had a lot of success, as you alluded to, in, uh, in Atlantic Canada uh, with our bubble. Um, how can we as a province kind of accelerate some of this change in economic development? And, and we are in kind of that case shape that you mentioned, but I think Atlantic Canada has built a bit of a reputation over the last eight months. How can we, how can we continue to build on that or accelerate it? Um, keep doing what you've done because it's uh it, it really is impressive to uh, much of the country even though it may feel like it's it, it, it it's it's turning around a bit negatively um it's still way ahead of uh most of most of us but start to think patrick about the growth opportunities of 21 and 22. in all likelihood the u.s economy is going to start to grow next year uh, in a very significant way. And there's a risk that it's going to grow faster than people are estimating. Uh, and you all know that when the U.S. economy starts to rip, boy, it roars. It is a powerful economy. The business forces of the U.S. are, 
are really impressive, <laughs> all the problems that the U.S. has. It, it, it's just, it continues to be an impressive innovation culture. And it's going to have capacity problems for all, all the reasons that you know well. And so it will be turning to the best, brightest, and most accessible alternatives. Hello, that's us, <laughs> to help uh, feed that growth. So I have to think that the Halifax region is really well positioned to step into that, not just to be the, 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 the outlet for standard growth, but to be the lever for a new generation of growth, to be able to say, you know what, we, we are very strong in the knowledge economy. So let's not just feed your growth, uh, America. Let's figure out how to transform it, uh, transform it together. That's the, the, the great North American model, but use our brain power uh, with the scale of the U.S. economy. It's not about our natural resources anymore and U.S. consumers. Of course, there's some of that. Increasingly, it's our brain power <laughs> with the brain power of the U.S. and the scale of the U.S. to really uh, 10x, as they say, the, uh, the opportunities. That's great. So you had mentioned, I think you alluded in one of the slides to, to women. Uh, and how they may have been disproportionately impacted um, during you know, what we've seen over the last number of months. It is, obviously, I guess it's not the same for women-owned businesses. Um, and is there something we can do to support those businesses as we go forward? You know, I, I, absolutely. This is one of the quiet crises um, of, of the bigger crisis. We put out uh, another piece of research on, on, on this this week, which we're sharing with uh, uh, governments at every, every level. And we think we have, have their uh, sincere attention. Uh, just as many small businesses were not prepared for the instant lockdown and the, and the shift of consumption to a digital model, Canadians spent more this summer than the previous summer. So the lockdowns did not lock down the consumer. They spent in very different ways. Uh, and uh, that's a, that will continue next year. We're expecting good consumption, uh, but it will be a different kind of consumption. Similarly, a lot of women were not prepared and not supported with the social infrastructure for the transition to work from home uh, or to run a business from home while also caregiving or managing uh, the multiple multiple demands of the uh, of the of the household. How do we use this uh, as a wake up call or a, a five alarm wake up siren to really invest in and and this is business a business imperative in the social infrastructure to help men and women, but it is way more women than men balance the demands of their lives so that they can be really productive, creative, innovative economic actors, as well as really great social actors. Lots of models around the world and models here in Canada that we can, we can, we can scale. Um, so I'm hoping we'll see some of that in the economic update next week. And the, it's critical for the provinces, which are on the front lines of this, uh, to invest in it, but also for employers to help innovate, help design new, new approaches so that females, and it isn't just employees, entrepreneurs, as you mentioned, are able to, uh, to go about their business in uh, a different way than they did in 2019. One of the podcasts I did uh, uh, maybe a month ago was with women entrepreneurs through the organization CEO. And one of the uh, uh, women on it, I asked the question, I said, is it is the, the, the daycare needs, because she's got young children, or the childcare needs different for an entrepreneur than an employee? She said, absolutely. I, you know, I, I, I don't have a nine to five job. I cannot drop my children at 8.30 at a daycare center and pick them up at, at five because my business is on at 8 p.m. or three in the morning. So entrepreneurs, and we, we need to be creative in our public policy on this, do have different, uh, different needs. Uh, and that's where chambers can be really valuable to, to help governments design these programs. That's great, thanks. One of the things I didn't hear you mention was artificial intelligence um, and, and what businesses should be thinking about when it comes to kind of advancing the digitization or the AI side of their business. Is that something that RBC has written on or you written on? Yeah, yeah, and, and a lot of challenges there, there too, but the, the acceleration 
of capabilities of AI is really exciting and, 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 and frightening. Uh, the New York Times did a story this week on uh, a Silicon Valley uh, organization whose algorithm had uh, kind of taken things to a new level, but uh, they had a beautiful illustration where they just asked the machine, what is creativity? And it just blurted back a, a, a beautiful paragraph. <laughs> I wish I could write, write that paragraph saying, this is what I think creativity is. Uh, that's exciting. That's exciting. Most businesses don't have that, that, that capacity, but collectively, through chambers, through business accelerators, through colleges and universities, we can be helping our businesses, especially our SMEs, harness this power. It comes back to that point about data. Data is that rushing river that you always have to have your meter in, and that meter is AI, understanding the currents, and then being able to predict the currents so that you know what your customers want, what they need, what they enjoy, when they when when, when they need it uh, that can be done without violating privacy but th that's also really important for education back to my point about personalizing education it's not about replacing the classroom but it's about understanding the student understanding how this how each student learns differently that is a gift for any teacher who can then stand in the classroom and teach much more effectively that's a gift for any doctor uh, if, if the doctor can better understand the patient and AI can help with that. That's the same for a, for, a, for a local store or a small manufacturer or a service provider. It's just about understanding the, uh, the world around you. Yeah. Well, that's great, John. Thank you. Uh, I, we've run out of time already and I've, I've taken screen grabs of your takeaways and what can you and your consumers do. Uh, so I'll be stealing those and, and, and looking them, at them again. If, if you had sort of 10 seconds to, to, uh, to tell us about RBC's COVID consumer spending tracker, is that something that's up on RBC's website somewhere or is that something you're publishing? No, it's, yeah, come to our thought leadership page and you'll see the consumer tracker, which shows changes through, uh, through the months as it, it captures the, 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 the surplus of consumption that we saw uh, over, over the summer and uh, shows it by sector. So Canadians uh, maybe are all part of this, spent more on golf this summer than the previous summer. We spent more on home renovations. We spent more on food. Uh, we spent more on booze, as uh, we probably all know. Uh, and of course, we spent less on uh, you know, restaurants and, and hotels and the, uh, the like. But in aggregate, we spent more. And I think that's, you know, if I can leave you with a positive message, uh, there is uh, opportunity out there. It's not opportunity as it may have looked before. Uh, and there's going to be opportunity out there next year and the year after. There's a lot of pent up demand. There's pent up savings, you know, knock on wood, things don't go uh, southward again uh, with the virus. But we can see the end. Uh, it, it may not be close enough for most of our liking, but the end is in distant sight. And when we get there, there is pent up demand. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of opportunity. And as we all know, as business actors and leaders, when you look back at crises past, it's often with regret of not seizing on that crisis in an opportunity. Many of the great companies around us came out of the, the, the financial crisis uh, because that's when disruption is really powerful. So when you have a moment to pause and think about your strategy, how do you think about what do you wish, let me rephrase that. In 2025, what might you regret not having done in 2021? And how do you get on with that uh, uh, sooner rather than later? So thanks Patrick as always to, uh, yeah. for your great questions and uh, always a delight to be with you. That's great, well thanks very much John, I really appreciate it. That's a great thought to leave us with. Uh, you know, what would we look back and say we regret? Uh, so let's try not to be in 2025 looking back uh, and having any regrets. Let's try and, uh, and try and move forward uh, with all of the businesses that are watching today. Businesses, not-for-profits, associations, and government. I can see some government folks on there too. So thanks very much to you, John. We'll have to have you back um, when we can spend more time because you are publishing so much information. There's, uh, there's always a lot to talk about. So thanks very much.